Welcome back to a very British space program. In this episode, we're going to be uh, well, we're going to be going to the moon. But before that, we've got to get some money. So we're going to launch a commercial payload. It is the fifth of October, nineteen sixty. Our EOS two craft are on the way to Mars. Let's get going. So we are launching yet another Red Princess. This is the Red Princess uh, 4C, I think it is. It's the C variant. So this has been operated. We've got a bit more control on it. And this is a an early communications or a communications satellite into an elliptical orbit. We're launching from Spade Adam. We've done this many times before. What we did find out at the end of our last episode, which we, we missed telling you, was that... Um, as our craft were leaving the sphere of influence, we got we got sources in the USSR that were telling us that um, their first attempt at launching a Mars probe was destroyed during launch, which we were obviously very um, uh, upset about because we we, would, we didn't want to you know see people fail. We were very upset about this, and um, you know we we know they're very capable and they've got a very capable launch system, and it's horrible to see that they've obviously got um, problems in their system. And <laughs> yeah, we were. So we, we you know as soon as they make it formal announcement about such a thing, we will be will be offering our assistance in whatever way we can. So um, yeah, if they had the fuel, they could have beaten us to Mars. Seems not the case though. So off we go. This craft gets into orbit really easy. You don't you don't need me to talk you through it because you know what. It's, it's become the workhorse and it's another batch of money for us. This is going to pay for it. And then just to help us, we're going to do another one. We're going to do an, a weather satellite right now. So this is going to be another weather satellite. And this is going to be on the Red Princess 4C again. And again, it's going to be another Red Bus 1 satellite, which is brilliant because these things roll out so nice and quickly at Spirit Adam at the moment. And we're getting loads of loads and loads of money for them. It's basically financing our space program. And this is this is important. Spirit Adam is pretty much making us the money right now um, we can't do anything else without it because we haven't completed any major milestones for quite a while because our technologies just need to catch up and to be fair we're getting a reputation for actually doing this you know the, we, we've offered we've offered some free rides to the americans for some of their satellites because they're a little behind us in their program but they have yet to accept those positions we, we even said they needn't bother developing their own you know rocket program because we could do that for them um so this this was launched on the in the 9th of October and uh, yeah we um, it was really easy it was you know that th it's just it's just money in the bank and I'm 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 gonna try and cut some of these as short as possible now but I do want you to see just actually what's going on in the in the space program and it, there is a lot of this you know financial contracts in the background and again it's we're now you can actually see the use there of of the improved upper stage there it's got multiple orientation uh, rcs points on it which means it's really much more capable of putting itself where it needs to be anyway we um we're going to refine our encounters with mars and this is about the 15th of october 1960 um and we're just trying to bring our encounters in with mars to a point whereby we're going to come close enough in the right direction so that and i'm, I'm i don't know if i actually get a good picture of this because i was jumping backwards and forwards all over the place to try and uh, to try and show you what was going on I had to actually sort it out myself uh, because the craft particularly as we've just left the earth's uh, soi they're very sensitive to any movement so we're actually aiming to go um, polar um, and what i'm actually trying to do is just put it to a slight side of polar um, just to affect our orbit a little bit and i'm also trying to get the right orbital speed the right time past that because and if I zoom out at some point, you'll see we actually get uh, a, a, an intro. There you go. So we're actually trying to uh, make first of all, make sure we get an interaction with Mars. But I'm also trying to get to a certain height to get some decent science. Um, and this is EOS, uh, one of the EOS, both of the EOS craft are basically doing it. And I think they both just have enough fuel to do this. One's got uh, quite a bit left, actually. So we may program it to fire its engines upon approach, but we're not going to do any refining of it. Um, the aim is that hopefully we can actually get them into a nice orbit where we can gather science off them. But this is a long term project. We, we don't want to wait until the next window to do this, but we may actually end up getting science back from our next set of crafts quicker than these ones. We will see. It, it, we are in a situation whereby we're going to have to wait probably another a few years to get this data back. It's going to be a bit of a, a task anyway. 
after doing that, we actually heard as we um, prepare and we launch um, this on the 4th of November 1960, this is another commercial flight to navigation satellite going to a highly inclined orbit, it's about 800 kilometers, uh, it's, it, is, it is almost circular. Um, on this craft we actually used a, a launch azimuth calculator that I have been trying to develop which is a lot of maths, if anybody ever wants to see it, it's a spreadsheet and uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, mathematical sort of trigonometrical equations going on there and uh, it's not perfect but that's how I managed to predict our original launch uh, azimuth. Um, I think I need to refine it a bit because I think it's not taking into account some factors that I, I need to so so particularly I'm setting it to uh, circularize at 200 but then I'm not doing that and it's anyway. While we were doing all of this calculation with our new advanced computer system, shh, don't tell anybody we've got computers. We don't don't tell them. Um, we uh, we heard that the um, <laughs> USS our second launch had a slight problem as well. It seems their third stage engines didn't seem to light, and um, they have not been lucky with their Mars missions, have they? So it seems as though Mars is is for us to take. We are likely to get the first craft there. As long as nothing happens, the problem we have is getting the data back from Mars. We might not be the first because if they go really quick for the next window. I don't know if, they, if they've got the transmitter capability, they might be able to get data back first. So we might not get first pictures of Mars. We will have to see. So anyway, this, this craft, yeah, wonderful. This is paying for our Mars missions. It's, uh, it's basically, it pops itself into orbit. It does what it needs to. You can see beautiful RCS controller, does all this work, boop -de -boop -de -boop. Um, And we're just doing lots and lots of these now. So it is the 6th of December 1960 and we have set ourselves a target which is before the year is out the UK aims to place its flag albeit on the inside of a craft onto the surface of the moon in a controlled manner we've hit the moon multiple times but now we also know the USSR has hit the moon and left its flag there but we don't count that because that, that was a crash so our aim is we wish to, uh, to land with control onto the surface of the moon. That's our aim. And to do that, we are launching this craft. It is a, uh, a white Trident 1A. You've seen it before. And upon the top of it, we have something we've called the Balu, uh, named after a, uh, an, an ancient spirit of, of the Australian people. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to embrace the Australians in this mission. Um, we're trying to show caring for them. And there you can see the Bahalu, which has basically got a transfer stage, which is a stripped down Newton 1A. We've basically stripped it down to its bare minimum because we, we need as much mass going to the moon as possible. And then on top of that, we've got a double stage solar powered um, landing and descent craft. So that has got a, uh, I believe it's got a Spectre engine on it and it's got uh, some little landing thrusters to try and help it land. And this is our first attempt at landing on the moon. We have another one of these that's about to go into production uh, because we would like to do a few landings and you know, we think uh, that's good. Um, getting into the orbit for this was, uh, was pretty easy. We were reasonably happy with it. Um, it, it just flies well, you know. The, the the Trident is 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 doing well at the moment. It's I don't see much of an upgrade route for it, um, unless we upgrade the pad and then we increase its booster numbers. We're really waiting for those those engines to get uh, get upgraded, and that's going to take us a while because we do not have the science. We don't have the money even to actually put into the science facilities, and it's you know we've we've spent we have spent a lot on our science facilities so far, but. Um, they are yet to uh, pay us back, shall we say. Um, so we, we are concerned because this is about as far as we can push. So there we go. We've got our transfer stage and then our, our Bahalu one into orbit. I suggested we call it a koala, but they, they wouldn't have it. Something about, you know, you can't send a koala to a moon and not bring it back because you'll get an animal rights activist having a go at you or something. I, I don't really get what they're coming at. But anyway, so we, we line up our transfer burn for the moon. Um, and where you can see there we've already got our two orbital craft hopefully if needed they can actually do some relaying if we come around the back of this uh, of the moon um, but we're not too worried because this is you know we've used our computers we've used our computers we used our computers for our previous launch azimuth we've been using them for this as well we've calculated exactly what we need to do this craft knows exactly what it's doing 
it's going to be easy. You know, we're, we're very confident. We're very confident about this. We, uh, we're not the Russians. They get engine, engine failures and all sorts of stuff and things blow up on launch. We don't do that. We have an engine failure. The thing keeps going. We've managed to send our Mars mission there without, without, with one engine failure. And we've, we've managed to, uh, do all sorts of stuff. We, we you know, we commercial craft that can still go with one engine missing. It's fine. It's not a problem. Anyway, we, we do our transfer burn, our trans lunar injection. Um, and this is what the biggest burn that we've got with this. This craft is, uh, is 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 actually on the limits of what we can do. It's it's pretty much it's the same weight as our Mars probes, um, and possibly a little bit more. So we were being a little cheeky with it. It, it was it was requiring every bit of fuel. So we're now using um, we've used our transfer stage, and we're just going to use our, our RCS to refine that there. And you'll see that we're actually quite a bit short of where we want to be. We've actually sh shut down the engine a significant amount earlier than we really should have, and that's uh, that may have been something we should have looked at before we continued on with the mission, shall we say? Yeah, no. Anyway, so we, we, we're going to get to the moon anyway. It's just a matter of um, where we're going to hit, where we're going to where we're going to touch down. Um, we would like to touch down on the light side, but mm, this is our first attempt, so we're gonna we're gonna go with it as best we can. So here we are, we're coming in. We want a nice tight approach to the moon so that we can actually get full joyous effect of the Oberth effect around the moon. So we must as much efficiency as possible. You can see that we're right down near the surface and we'll, we'll set a program up there for it to burn on, on periaps so that it'll circularize. And you'll see there we're just going to detach. Um, there we go. And our probe is now off on its way. We just check if we got Okay. Oh no, we've actually we've actually accidentally the force of the decoupler has actually sent us into uh, a slight problem, which is uh, we're going to hit the moon. Mm. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait until we're actually in the sphere of influence of the moon, and then we'll just change that. We'll just uh, correct that situation just a little smidgen, because yeah, no, actually, you know what? We're going to go direct descent. We might as well. We don't need to circularize. The craft's fine. So the team decide that instead of going for a circularization, we're just going to go direct descent. It's the, pretty much the same amount of energy, isn't it? You know, um, more of that energy has to be expelled in one go, but you know, same amount of energy, not a problem. So we line up, we prepare for our initial, uh, our deorbiting stage. This stage is going to basically fire f far, fast and hard. Its job is to kill off as much Delta V as it can and to basically bring us to a point where we're ready to land. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. We've, we've got our little kind of landing prediction computer there. So it's gonna tell us roughly, and I've never used this before, so this was an interesting experience for me. It's supposed to tell us, you know, how long until we hit, and then, you know, we suicide burn calculator style. Um, I don't really trust them that much, but anyway. So we, we do a little RCS burst, we fire up the Spectre engine, and this thing is just gonna go until it is dry. It is gonna use every blot of energy, which is what it does. It, it didn't have much, gets rid of itself, and then we're gonna prepare ourselves and we're gonna fire up the little tiny thrusters that we've got on the bottom of this craft. So we're just gonna bring ourselves in and we maybe fired the spectres a little bit too early looking at it. We've still got a lot of height to go. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we've still got a lot of speed as well though. So the, the ground is now coming up, but it's okay because we've got we've got the engines on, we're slowing down, it's not a problem. You know, we, we were fully accounted for, for what's going on doesn't matter I see the spectre's still there the 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 deorbiting stages is, is yet to hit the ground it's you know we're slowing down reasonably fast the data's coming in we're very we're very happy with what's happening um obviously it would be nice if we were going a little slower right now because we're you know now is the time when we need to really be not going this fast this this fast is not good at this sort of altitude and it, slowing slowing would be better now it would be better to to slow right now oh yeah well with that happening it seems the uh, the australian site is reeling from its failure um the the blue 1b was immediately cancelled um the project will have to be reevaluated. We're, we're not sure that design is suitable for that task um management is going to be reassessed anyway to to try and make us feel a bit better the the uk team has decided that they're going to uh, it is the 14th of december 1960 they're going to target 120 kilometers of altitude. Um, it's Carol Freeman. She's going up. Um, 
Normally we would have Kim Jarvis in the craft, but uh, Kim is away on a special mission at the moment. It's um, We have something special coming, uh, something very special. All of our money, all of our research has been put towards the craft that she is preparing to fly. And um, it's a big one. It's a big, important landmark craft. But uh, that does mean that the, this that this flight, the Javelin 2A, is available for for um for Carol to fly, you know. And Carol, Carol, since she's returned to the UK, is actually doing very well. She's uh she's looking after herself. She's looking after the craft. She's not had any odd incidents. And with the recent incident in Australia, people are starting to wonder whether it was Carol all along that was the problem. Maybe it was actually uh, the Australian team and their approach to to this stuff that was actually putting her at risk. So anyway, Carol is flying beautifully, and she can see here she's doing some high-speed turns. She's trying to prove that this airframe design is actually as maneuverable as the as the White Javelin one, um, because to her that is important. Um, so as she comes in, we're gonna we're gonna slow it down, prepare for her landing. Um, we are gonna we're gonna leave Carol there as she comes in. Um, next episode, Kim is gonna take us on a very interesting journey. I hope so. Until next time. Have a great one.